Well, good evening, everyone. How, hi, Arthur. How nice to see you all here tonight. It's really uh, been a lively week of conversation around this topic and certainly in the media in recent weeks, but in our own community this week. So I am really pleased that you came out tonight to have this conversation. I'm Laurie Norton Moffat, Director and CEO of Norman Rockwell Museum, and we discovered this is our fifth year of hosting our Four Freedoms Forums, which aim to have a community town hall conversation around issues of national and global importance and examine them on a community level. So home is where the heart is. Home sweet home. Home for the holidays. There's no place like home. We in America have been raised on these nostalgic sentiments on the idea of home. Home in its most fundamental definition is a place of shelter a roof over one's head to shield from the elements, a place to sleep safely, a place to feed, educate, pray, and raise one's family, a place of safety and security protected by laws and by the government. At its best, a house becomes a home, a place to raise a family, to enjoy the camaraderie of friends, practice one's spirituality, enjoy music, art, literature, create and pass along traditions, make memory, indeed to create an enduring culture and to contribute to a community. But for many people around the world, home is not a place of safety and security. For too many, home is threatened by government repression, by war, drug gangs, poverty, starvation, religious persecution, racial discrimination, even ethnic cleansing or genocide. According to 2014 annual figures from the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, there are almost 60 million refugees and internally displaced people around the globe. Put another way, that's one, and these are 2014 figures, one in every 122 people worldwide who are not safe in their home country. And we know those numbers have grown in the last two years. Tonight we're making a distinction, and there is a distinction between immigration and refugees. So what, how do we define being an immigrant to the United States? We'll focus on our country. An immigrant is described as someone who chooses to resettle in another country. The United States has a legal process for an immigrant to seek legal re residency and eventually citizenship. Some come as students or professionals seeking more opportunity. Most come legally through a lengthy process. Other immigrants, however, uh, have not pursued legal status and are considered undocumented. As such, they may be subject to removal or deportation from the United States, and there are estimated to be 11 million undocumented immigrants in the United States, and Congress has been deadlocked for years on how to reform immigration laws. Migrants, especially economic migrants, choose to move in order to improve the future prospects for themselves and their families, the UN Commi uh, High Commissioner for Refugees says. But refugees have to move if they are to save their lives and preserve their freedom. So how is a refugee defined? And we're going to hear more about this by one of our speakers tonight. A refugee is someone who has been forced to flee his or her home country. Most can never again return home safely. They leave everything behind to save their lives or the lives of their children. These displaced persons or refugees can apply for asylum in the United States, a process that can take years. And getting refugee status isn't easy or assured. Applicants have to prove that if they return to their home country, they'll be injured because of their race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group, or their political opinion. Refugees are generally people outside of their country who are unable or unwilling to return home because they fear serious harm, the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services says. America is a nation of immigrants and refugees. 
immigrants and refugees have made this nation. Debate rages today on immigration and on admitting refugees to America. Most recently, as two weeks ago, President Trump issued an immediate and temporary ban on travel to un the United States from seven countries, many of which have citizens in refugee status or who have progressed through the legal process of immigration or seeking refugee status here in the United States. This widely contested ban was overturned by federal judiciaries and is at this moment being appealed and new orders uh, being said they'll be issued. So tonight, here in the Berkshires at Norman Rockwell Museum, we will hear from three community thought leaders to give us background on these topics, and then we'll invite all of you here to have a conversation. Just a reminder about our brief guidelines when speaking and fostering civil discourse and respectful listening. We just ask that you come to the microphone and state your name and where you live. And then you'll have two minutes to ask a question or make a statement or refute something or contribute further to something someone else has said. All opinions are welcome here. But we do ask that there be no applauding or, or expression of disagreement about a speaker's opinion. We hope everyone will listen and learn and take new ideas home with them and continue the conversation when you leave the museum. We have three wonderful thought leaders tonight. Uh, you have their biographies. Dr. Asma Abbas is the Associate Professor of Politics and Philosophy at Bard College at Simons Rock in Great Barrington. She's also founding director of Hick Rosa, an art, politics, and education collective which hosts the False Work School, moving communities of study on key social and political issues in the Berkshires and abroad. And I invite you to read uh, the rest of her biography. Uh, Hillary Green is the director of the Berkshire Immigrant Center. She grew up in the Berkshires and graduated from Mount Greylock Regional High School and earned her BA in Soviet and Russian Studies from Colby College. Her interest in immigration began in the early 90s when she spent four years living and working as an expatriate in St. Petersburg, Russia. And Dr. Charles Park is an assistant professor of English at Berkshire Community College. Prior to joining the college, he taught a wide range of composition and literature courses at both two and four year institutions. And his research and presentations and teaching focus on the creation of multicultural identity in community and consumer culture. And he will tell us a bit about his Berkshire Immigrant Stories project as well. So thank you again for joining us tonight. Um, we can pull more, more chairs in and speak in the round. I hope you can all hear in the side galleries there. And our first um, thought leader tonight will be Dr. Park. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie. Um, I want to uh, thank the Norman Rockmill Museum for uh, hosting this, and I'd like to thank all of you for uh, making your way out on a frigid February <laughs> evening. Um, my name is Charles Park, and uh, I am an assistant professor of English at uh, Berkshire Community College. Um, my background, however, is in Asian American studies, and uh, my work, my research focuses largely on Asian Americans uh, in the United States, uh, particularly since 1965, when the um, uh, immigration laws uh, changed and allowed larger numbers of Asian Americans or Asians to come to the United States for Asian Americans to uh, sponsor their families come to come to the United States uh, as well. Uh, my work, however, extends from that, uh, and um, I, I think about uh, the, the, uh, the changes that also wrought on uh, populations of minority groups who were already here, because that law in 1965 uh, changed the, uh, uh, the status and uh, the, uh, the conditions of Latinos uh, coming to the United States, for instance, uh, as well as uh, the relationship between uh, Asian Americans and black Americans uh, in, in many uh, urban areas as well. Um, I think a lot of the, th the, um, the things that we're hearing about uh, immigration bans and the uh, detention of certain groups of people um, are very relevant in those of us who've been studying Asian American history, however, because uh, we have been subject to this. Uh, Asian Americans have been subject to uh, detentions, unconstitutional and unlawful detentions. 
um, Asians have been barred for a very long time from coming into the United States uh, as uh, unwanted or undesirable immigrants uh, or aliens. Um, and so I think uh, thinking about our history of immigration and immigration policy can teach us quite a lot about where we are uh, and um, the mistakes that we should not be making any longer, I think, uh, as a country, as a nation. Um, and also, I think one of the reasons why I was invited to actually sort of talk about this is because, uh, and I like to plug my program here a little bit, uh, is that I'm the, uh, the project director uh, for the Berkshire Immigrant Stories, which is the first year project for the uh, establishment of a public humanities center uh, at Berkshire Rock Community College. Uh, we uh, are working in partnership with uh, Mass Humanities with funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, and we are going to be establishing um, a center uh, where we can uh, benefit the community of the Berkshire community, uh, Berkshire County uh, by collecting and uh, sharing uh, various stories of, uh, and the history of the Berkshire County as a whole. Our first year project is uh, again called Berkshire Immigrant Stories and we're trying to collect as many stories uh, and artifacts of, uh, of immigrants to the Berkshire County, uh, especially those uh, who either um, themselves or um, were the children of those who came to the, uh, to the United States and the Berkshire since 1965. Uh, we will be having a workshop next uh, Thursday at the uh, Athenaeum at 6 o'clock. Um, if you yourself are an immigrant or are children of immigrants, you know, I, I encourage you to come uh, bring an artifact that tells a story of your, uh, of your immigration and, uh, and share those stories with us. Um, I have a number actually of uh, these cards as well uh, with more information about the project um, and more information about um, uh, you know, how you can get involved, how you can share your stories, as well as uh, my contact information here as well. Um, and we like to start, uh, and, and you might have seen this through our Facebook page or through uh, our college's website, but we like to start by saying, you know, we're all immigrants. We all came from somewhere else. And so it is important, I think, for us to remember that and uh, remember that we are a county of immigrants. Thank you. Dr. Abbas is our next speaker. Hello, everyone. I was here exactly five years ago. On, I think it was the first town hall meeting on civility, and I remember um, I was, I felt most enabled by my students who <laughs> showed up um, because there was something, um, sort of they remind us what we are here for. Um, and. And second, it was also, I think I just discovered that I might have a child. I think I told Valerie that that day, and she's now four and a half years old. And the day after the election, um, when I had like, s was up pretty much all night, my husband slept, but I didn't. And I remember texting my provost saying, we've got to do something for the kids tomorrow. Like I'll open my class up, like we'll, we'll hang out all day. And I didn't cry. I'm not like the crier, you know. <laughs> but when she was singing a very beautiful devotional song in, in Urdu in my car, that's when I broke down because I had no idea. <laughs> I had not. She was the one <laughs> that...
seems to somebody like me who, who lives in language, who lives in multiple languages, or who thinks that what we are doing together is making meaning with each other, and if we can't make meaning <laughs> with each other, there's no purpose of even wanting to be together, right? And I'd rather go and, as one of my favorite authors, Hannah Arendt says, I'm likely to commit suicide because that's when I'm isolated and nobody understands what I have to say and nobody is willing to engage in a space of, you know, people that die only of the concentration camp. Those who survived died because they were left alone and political communities abandoned them. And that's something we have to remember in this time. So we're not only, it's not only the abandoning or the abdication from the refugee in the production of whom we have all been complicit, each of us, um, seems to be an important message that like from, from the our interpersonal relationships to what's happening at the border, there's a deep connection that I'd like us to not forget just because we're trying to expediently solve the problem of how to get 15 people, 15 people jobs in Pittsfield, right? <laughs> so, so the scale, so I, I guess I have a few thoughts, you know, I don't want to sort of go, go on, but um, the question, I think I've often been bothered by the refugee crisis the idea that there's a crisis, and I keep thinking, like, whose is it? Is the refugee the production? <laughs> is the refugee making the crisis? Is, is it a crisis because the refugee exists? Who's taking responsibility of that? And, and what I start to fear is that when anybody invokes a crisis, I'm always afraid that somebody is going to step in to create order, right? To wit, the executive order, right? So there's something <laughs> that there's no refugee as a term that it would exist without state power, right, or the production of states. And I mean, to think that countries can be the object of our love, right, objects that are so recently created in history, international relations that didn't exist more than 200 or some years ago, nation states that didn't exist more than maybe 70 years ago that are shaping every way we interact with each other, every way we think who has a claim on what seems to be a problem. And I don't think as a teacher that these are big questions or abstract questions that somehow are irrelevant to how we treat each other because I think that even at sub specific levels when we ask about, oh, what is the crisis a refugee creates that we must try to solve, even turning to issues of cultural difference, right, is a way to eradicate the history of deep racism, racializing that starts from the history of slavery that's not a shock to the system that has always, that's produced this system to, <laughs> to the, the Holocaust, to the fact that the Muslim is the new Jew, right? In that world, in the same world that has gone unchanged, right? So I guess I'm just thinking about what we do when we treat things as crisis and then are shocked by them, right? And as I just feel like, I wrote the other day, I was teaching these Pittsfield High School students um, we were reading Gl Gloria Anzaldúa's How to Tame a Wild Tongue, and I asked, and the saddest thing was that they kept saying that their, <laughs> their most potent experience of silence is in the classroom, that they felt like the teachers weren't listening, right? And I kept thinking, that's sort of, <laughs> that's the one moment where I realized, well, I did find refuge in education, right? Even where I am now, wh where I'm teaching, the fact that the classroom is the least lonely place in this time says something about exactly what struggles we have given that it's just at the level of our sensibility, what we will hear, how we will respond, what we are, I mean, uh, Theodore Adorno is one of my other favorite writers, like wrote this beautiful essay, which I recommend everybody reading, it's called Education After Auschwitz. And he said like, repeating the lessons of history, even in the hands of the German state, doesn't prevent the recurrence of something like the Holocaust. You have to treat things at the level of the very cultivated coldness and hardness that like we develop, right? We have to, a lot of work has to be done to produce people who will be cold and hard. And that, so then to beg for compassion in the name of saying, look, those are the most vulnerable people at our doors, let them in. Or look, they will be productive citizens. These are also histories that have actually erased the complicity of the West and of imperial Europe and imperial United States in the production of all of these people who have nowhere to go, right? Even the shift from, you know, historically, right, if you want to think about Algeria and the colonization, when Algerian natives came to the door of France to be migrant workers, 
their whole history of subjection was erased precisely because now France could welcome them as migrant workers, right? So I'm just saying, however we try to solve our problems, I'm not going to stand in anyone's way, <laughs> but I think we have to hear the outsider or who Arendt calls the pariah because they're the ones most interested in making this world better because they're the ones who don't own it, <laughs> right? Like we are the ones who come to make something better because we chose this place to be here, not those who you've always been. No, but none of you have always ever been here either, right? That's what Tom and I were working on in the summer, that whose place is this, <laughs> right? So the fact that we have all come here at different times is really crucial in understanding that when we decide who can be with us and not, just remember, <laughs> just remember what hand we had in the production of that problem and to even think of another human being as a problem, right? What, what, what complete, like, insane blindness is that, that either makes us think that a human being in need is a problem, a human being whose need we have produced is our problem, or the fact that we have to somehow make a plea that somebody who's productive should be let in, but not a disabled child, right? They just passed a law in England saying disabled children cannot enter cannot be, re disabled children who are refugees cannot, do not have a have room. So, I mean, I guess I'm just throwing out these things because they do actually float around. The world is not linear. We cannot think linearly, and that's where we have to kind of disrupt any attempt at making things neat, because making things neat without consulting those who are deemed the mess is always going to assert, is keep you in the position of a power, and y we, all of us, who have been in power haven't done well with it. Otherwise, this world wouldn't be how it is. So just a little bit of humility and a little bit of listening. Thank you so much. And now we'll hear from Hillary Green, the director of the Berkshire Immigrant Center. Good evening. Thank you, Charles and Asma. Hello, Dr. Herr. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Look at my back. Um, the last time I was here was in September, and we were having a naturalization swearing in ceremony. It's a partnership that the Immigrant Center and the Norman Rockwell Museum has had now for five years. And at that ceremony, we had the four freedoms in the backdrop, the perfect backdrop we um, welcomed 17 new American citizens. Three of them came to the United States as refugees. Uh, Lori had mentioned that my background was in Soviet and Russian studies. And when I returned from St. Petersburg, I was living at home with my parents rather unhappily. And there was a job opening in the paper for a Russian speaker, probably the only <laughs> time ever in the Berkshire Eagle that had <laughs> advertised this. Um, the most exciting thing ever for me, and that job was to do refugee resettlement at the Jewish Federation of the Berkshires. Um, and at the time, starting in the late 80s, the Jewish Federation resettled, um, it, in the end, 186 people from the former Soviet Union, Jews uh, escaping religious persecution. So. In 1997, when I joined um, the Jewish Federation, uh, this was how I got involved. Um, we also began a citizenship assistance program because we were doing this work with the refugees. And then it seemed to be a parallel time when another wave of immigrants were moving into the Berkshires. Um, I like to say that the Jewish Federation had this incredible foresight um, because we started to see a lot of people coming primarily at that time from Central and South America. So we started the citizenship program for um, everyone, and eventually um, the U.S. refugee policy changed. Um, we, the countries that refugees were coming from shifted, so the Jewish Federation stopped being a voluntary agency, and the offshoot of that was the Berkshire Immigrant Center. And the reason for that was that w there were so many other needs of our new immigrant and refugee community. Um, beyond, I mean, citizenship still remains one of our primary missions, and, um, and we love it. But helping people to get their legal permanent residency, 
um, to renew their green cards, various visa issues, both non-immigrant and immigrants, um, family reunification, helping people to file relative petitions. And so that's sort of the core of what we do nowadays. Um, when I was here, I think it was maybe four years ago, we had a forum on immigration, the Four Freedoms on Immigration. And um, in preparing for that talk, I learned about Carlos Bulasan. And um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with him. He's a poet who was commissioned by President Roosevelt um, to write an essay for the freedom of want uh, in the Saturday Evening Post. And his essay is absolutely beautiful if you get a chance to, to read it. Carlos was a Filipino immigrant, a migrant worker, um, and he struggled with this duality of um, where is my place in America? And I just want to read a quote. Um, the end of his essay says, but our march to freedom is not complete unless want is annihilated. The America we hope to see is not merely a physical, but also a spiritual and intellectual world. We are the mirror of what America is. If America wants us to be living and free, then we must be living and free. If we fail, then America fails. What do we want? We want complete security and peace. We want to share the promise and fruits of American life. We want to be free from fear and hunger. For Bulasan, freedom from want was the difference between living to survive and living with purpose. The opportunity to live with freedom, to live a dignified life, to live with purpose, is what all refugees are seeking. So I, was anyone at the meeting last night, um, the Jewish Federation of Springfield, for starting up new refugee resettlement? So I'm just going to give you a little bit of background. Um, in November, there was a public forum. The Jewish Federation of Springfield is uh, identified Pittsfield as being a really positive place to resettle, um, primarily Syrians. And, um, and that is because rents are low, jobs are available, and it was that, and Pittsfield is, and the surrounding communities are identified as being very welcoming places. Um, at that meeting, there was some dissension. Um, people were very concerned about security, and I'm sure when we have our public discourse, we can talk more about the vetting process for, for refugees um, and security, s security concerns. Um, but for the most part, the, the general public was very positive. And um, the Jewish Federation went back and uh, they had to apply to the Department of State and they finally, just recently, in the last couple of weeks, got approval from the Department of State to move forward with resettling 50 individuals, 15 employable. <laughs> and of course, then the executive orders came along. And, um, and even though there is you know, a, a temporary stay on that, um, the process and the flow has been, s has been halted. Um, and we had anticipated that families could be arriving any day now, um, and at this point, there's total clarity. We're hoping maybe April. There are two, um, two families have been identified. One is, um, well, one individual, it, an individual male, and a family of five are to be the first um, people from Syria that would be coming to Pittsfield, and like I said, hopefully in April, but we don't know. Um, Another part of the executive order is that uh, President Trump wants to drastically reduce the number of refugees that we admit every year. Um, last year, President Obama boosted them to 110,000, um, which was up by, I think, 30,000, 30, um, and agreed to take in 10,000 Syrians, which is a very, very tiny number compared to a lot of European countries. Um, so now President Trump wants to cut that number in half, well, to about 50,000. And of course, we know he wants to stop um, those coming from the seven banned countries. So we're staying positive that soon we will have families. And certainly, I'm sure you've heard in the news, there's ways that you can get involved in terms of furniture donations and volunteerism. And um, hopefully, you will all stay tuned with that. So 
questions. Thank you. Thank you all very much for framing the issue um, in all of its complexity and, and breadth. And um, now, really, the forum is yours. It's open for discussion, question, opinion, uh, inquiry, anything you might like to talk about. And please, come to the microphone, and members say your name and where you live, and um, we'll start the conversation. Hi, my name is Bob Rosen, I live in Otis. I have a basic question. We hear all the time that there are 11 million undocumented immigrants in this country. My first question is, how did that happen? What is it that we did in this country wrong that allowed it to happen? And my second question is, did it all occur or come out of the Immigration Act of 1965? Is that when we got this the wave of immigrants came to this country because of a lessening of immigration status? And then there was really nothing going on with issues with immigration until we got to the Iraq war. And my question is, is that what brought all the fear and the problems that we now see with the immigration population coming in? America's always had an immigration population and they've always had issues with immigration. But now it just seems to have gone in a direction where a lot of us don't understand why it's happening. And I'm wondering whether or not the experts that are here tonight can explain how did we get here? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, I don't know if it was the Iraq war, I think it was September 11th, that really is what caused us to be much more, um, I, I think, frightened of, um, of people coming in and, and what could happen. Uh, I think that we've had immigration forever. I mean, we are a country of immigrants. We certainly see waves coming um, undocumented in responses to crises. Um, we see right now um, unaccompanied minors coming from Guatemala and Honduras and um, you know, taking these amazing trips, riding trains through Mexico to get here because they need opportunity. There's nothing for them. There's violence, there's war, there, there's no um, economic opportunity for them. So, um, and the, the other portion of the un undocumented that we see mostly locally are people who have come um, on some kind of visa, whether it be a student visa or a temporary work visa or tourist visa, and, um, and again, realize there's nothing for them to go back to. Um, and so they overstay their visa and become out of status and become undocumented. So. How did it become 11 million? I think it's been over a very long period of time. Um, and again, I think fits and starts. Um, many of those that are here who are undocumented do have legal relief, um, which is something that we try to do at the Berkshire Immigrant Center. Um, whether it's um, DACA recipients, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, the kids who were brought to the United States prior to 2007 before they reached their 16th birthday, um, or um, asylees, uh, many of these un unaccompanied minors who have the opportunity to, to make a asylum claims. Um, so yeah, maybe you can hand it. I think the, uh, the first thing we need to think about is that when we talk about 11 million undocumented immigrants um, or how many ever Im uh, undocumented um, immigrants we have, um, they're not all, first of all, Latinos. There are a lot of undocumented immigrants from other parts of uh, the world as well. So I just wanna um, make sure that we're not talking about you know, a certain group of people uh, without actually naming them. Um, I do want to say that immigration has always been a source of um, uh, anxiety in this country. 
uh, going all the way back into the 19th century, uh, in 1882, uh, the threat of the Chinese coming into this country was so big that, uh, that we actually banned uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the migration of the Chinese into this country. That was the first time that we had legislation that specifically banned the whole um, race of people or an, uh, or an ethnicity of people from coming in. Shortly thereafter, we also excluded the Japanese in this country by and large as well. Um, that wasn't to say, though, that there weren't you know, Chinese and Japanese coming into the country. I mean, they, they, people still found ways to come in just um, through various loopholes and, and things like that. Um, and I'd be more than happy to talk about some of those things later, um, if you like. Um, after that, I mean, there were some anxieties about um, the Irish and the Italians coming in who were undesirable uh, in the early part of the, uh, the 20th century. Um, largely because the Irish and Italians were seen as somewhat subhuman, not quite as highly developed as the Anglo-Saxon, also because they were Catholic, um, and therefore they were probably a part of a, uh, a larger international Catholic conspiracy. Um, and so there was a threat of that. Irish and the Italians still came to this country. Uh, I'm sure many of them undocumented. Um, for people who are of Irish and Italian descent, if you go back far enough, you'll probably all of a sudden see a member of your family showing up through a marriage to an American citizen, um, but don't know how they got there. Um, so, I mean, we've always had an, an anxiety about immigration. We've always had illegal immigrants coming into this country. Um, I do want to say also that there are actually more um, migrants leaving the country than coming in illegally uh, at this point. A lot of that is because uh, of the, uh, the economic downturn in our country as well, um, as well as just um, the, uh, the political climate. Um, and I mean, there's some you know, people saying that if we were to build a wall, that might actually make it harder for people to leave the country uh, as well. Um, as far as the, um, the, 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 uh, the Immigration and um, Nationality Act of 1965 is concerned, that did actually change the, uh, the fate of a lot of Latinos coming to this country. And, and you know, just you know, to be very blunt, when we talk about illegal immigrants, a lot of people are thinking of Latinos, Mexicans, Central Americans. Um, what the, um, that law did was it essentially um, eliminated the quota of people coming from um, specific nations and put a, um, a cap on, on the hemisphere. Um, so a, 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 you know, a, a X number of people coming in from the Western hemisphere as opposed to the Eastern hemisphere of our globe. Uh, before that law, um, we had actually a very generous um, uh, methods or, uh, or avenues for um, workers to come from, um, from Mexico, and uh, largely from Mexico actually, uh, as guest workers, um, and it was a lot easier for them to actually come into the country as um, documented immigrants. Um, but after that law, it did make it harder for Latinos to come in. Having said that, I think we also have to understand that it's not always easy for a lot of these people to quote unquote get in line and come into this country legally. The, um, the immigration process to come into the United States is incredibly time consuming. It is very difficult. Uh, it does take a lot of money. And uh, if you don't already have family members in this country who are here documented and settled uh, and can sponsor you, it does become very difficult. So when we talk about, you know, why don't these people get in line and come in uh, legally like you know my grandparents did or you know whomever um, a lot of these people can't wait that long because we don't allow um, we just you know the um, the rules and the laws are just so difficult um, that if you don't already have that network of family members and things it is very difficult to come in and there is the um, there's the pull uh, the push factor of a lot of instability in these countries, a lot of violence, uh, economic instability, things like that. There is also the, the uh, I think, the pull of our country needing a large number of uh, unskilled, cheap labor. And I think we can, you know, that's sort of a, a different topic that we can sort of talk about and explore uh, a little bit. Um, but 
these migrants come, these undocumented migrants come because we do need their labor um, in a lot of our agriculture and a lot of um, um, industries like, uh, like the meatpacking industries um, that is difficult, that doesn't pay very well, the working conditions are not very good, uh, but they're willing to come and work because um, you know, it's, it's better than what th they were able to or they would be able to get um, you know, in their home countries as well. So I think there's a lot of factors. It's not just one law, it's not just one thing, it's not just one event. I think there's a lot of um, complex issues that, that we can sort of go through. But I do wanna say that you know, we've always had anxieties about immigrants in this country. We've always had anxieties about refugees in this country. Um, so I think something that you will, you've probably heard over and over again and will read over and over again is that we've been here before. This is not a new moment. This is just a repetition of something that's already happened. And I think it's upon us to, to, to consider, do we wanna do, do we wanna make the mistakes of the past or do we wanna do something new? Do we wanna do something different than what we've done in the past? like to address another question or speak, please. We also are taking questions online. This is being live streamed, so if anyone has a question online, you can submit it. My name is Catherine Levitin. I live in New Lebanon. I have a, uh, my question is, for those of us who want to do something politically or as a community, do you have any suggestions what we can do to help both of refugee situation as far as allowing more refugees into the country and doing something about our immigration problem, uh, generally helping the undocumented immigrants stay in the country without fear uh, that they are being put through now. Uh, and do you have any positive suggestions you can give us to do? There's a lot of citizen action in the county right now. If there are any of you who are involved in that and would like to tell us what you're doing and organizing and participating in, I'd love to hear it. Please. You can also queue in front of the microphones and just come on up. My name is Joanne Rogovin, and we're very much at the beginning of this, but the we have formed something called the Berkshire Women's Action Group. And I know that we've been in touch with Hillary. Um, and our purpose is to generate grassroots efforts, gra grassroots actions that will mitigate against some of the things that we're hearing and seeing in the county uh, around immigration, education, health care, the environment. Um, what did I say? In any event, um, if anybody is interested, and we welcome men, <laughs> believe me, um, if anybody is interested in uh, getting our, our um, information, uh, please feel free to just give me your, your email, your contact information. We, our next meeting is on March 7th, March 7th, I think, March 6th. Um, but we don't have a place yet, so. Um, we would have to let you know. But anybody who's interested in finding out what we're doing, we're a group of over 80. We just started, so it's very encouraging. Um, and we'd love to have you join us. Um, we're going, one of the things we're really focusing on is collaborating with, with Hillary and with um, other groups, with, with uh, Multicultural Bridge, with other organizations that are really working in this community and see if we can lend, if we can lend our strength and experience, et cetera, to that. Hi, everybody. My name is Jennifer Hermansky, and I'm the executive director of the Literacy Network of South Berkshire. Um, we are a small nonprofit that provides tutoring support for adults, and the majority of our students are immigrants. We have about 90% of our 130-ish students that are immigrants learning English, and so we're always looking for volunteers um, to, to help teach, and um, to if you are interested in getting involved with us, um, feel free to reach out. We're at uh, litnetsb.org. It's Literacy Network of South Berkshire. I think the, the thought on that is just, um, 
There's a great quote um, on our end right somewhere that um, it's our foes who sent us to the concentration camps, but it's our friends who sent us to the internment camps. So I guess I'm just going to say that, yes, in all our actions, when we try to sort of problem solve, just to keep central the analysis of race, right? Like, so of course, the, <laughs> the word racism wasn't used in your, you know, like the, the, the creation of the anxiety about the immigrant is about the anxiety of the racial other and the, the, how central it is to the structure of wealth and capital, like against our will, it's precisely on unintentional things that produce somehow the worst outcome. So I guess that I'm just saying like, as much as we produce spaces for action, it's really important to produce thoughtful spaces of inaction. And I, I'm saying that very confidently that without thought, action will only reproduce what it has happened. And I really, if everything seems really critical, but just taking the time is itself a kind of resistance, right, to everybody's speed through a lot of shit we are facing, right? So the, their quickness has to be, like you have to, we have to jam the, glue up the wheels, not just make them spin faster. And I mean that most sincerely as an educator. to see so many students and uh, younger members of our population in the community here. Would any of you like to come to the microphone and offer your thoughts? <laughs> so um, I'm one of the interns at Mass MoCA. I'm Felicia Eddy. And I love that we have this community forum, a way to speak about some of the things that are personally on our minds and in our hearts. Um, but I think that for me, I'm trying to process like how this immigration issues are related to, as you were saying, issues of class, race, and gender. And um, you know, there's lots of ways that we can speak out, but I'm trying to figure out more um, like ways to think about these things and you know just process it. But I was wondering how everyone else is kind of processing it in their own way and just like thinking about these issues and how they connect. Um, so just an idea. Uh, to answer the last two speakers, I'm Lamel Pulitzer, and I live here in Stockbridge, and I'm passionate about this museum. Sometimes I'm actually a docent here, especially in the fair weather. But what I've been doing since the election to keep my wits about me is rereading a book uh, about Thomas Jefferson, The American Sphinx. He was the most written about president we ever had. And he came after John Adams and did not agree with a single thing that John Adams had said. And the way that he came in to the office, he only wrote at his desk all day. He never had public meetings. And we now celebrate him more than any other president. So I would suggest that a review of our founding fabulous people who started our this delicate balance of democracy has been a very resourceful exercise for me. I've also been traveling and I was in Ecuador, which uses the American dollar and has a democracy. And the children were on the plane because it was their holiday. And they were asking me and my group of friends, do you like this man? What is going on? They think we might like him, <laughs> and they're very scared. They're actually scared. So I think that our steps, as you say, should be thoughtful and procedural, and as though I'm not sure what one is going to come next, we do have to keep our wits about us now, as never before, and to organize in stable government systems will be an enormous help moving all the way up the chain, write succinct, clear letters to the senators 
that will help them continue to do the same. Thank you. Uh, just to be clear, any of the seven nations uh, that Trump has singled out, have they wound up sending any terrorists here, like ever? So refugees who have arrived from those seven countries um, out of, now the number is, I'm losing it, it's several hundred thousand. There have been three arrests. They all took place abroad and they were all due to threats, no physical violence. So three out of, I wanna say 800,000. I think there's a theme emerging of certainly people have been, have been many people in our nation and even in our community, many in our community have felt compelled to act, compelled for action. We have to do something now. And we have coalitions and we have protests and we have rallies and activity. And now we're hearing conversation about the necessity of pause and thoughtfulness and thinking through what can be helpful rather than reactionary. And I'm interested to know what you th think about that, what feels comfortable to each of you, uh, how compelled to action you're, are you feeling? You've all come out tonight. You're clearly interested in this topic and conversation and presumably want to help or maybe have some fear, uh, maybe have questions and you just don't really quite know what you can do or how to think about it. Um, would, is that something you'd like to talk about? Come on up, please. I'm Rachel Branch and I'm from North Adams. <coughs> I've had a community television show called Solutions Rising. And this is my fifth year and I accent on stopping the violence against women and girls and others who have suffered. But it's all about, if each, my signature line is, if each one of us picked up one problem and solved it, imagine the incredible view we would all have of solutions rising. Everybody in this room and everybody who cares has a gift. No one has to tell you what it is, you know what it is, and you will find a way to use it. When I think of the Immigrant Center, <coughs> um, I think it's very important not to decide what you're gonna do without contacting the person or the organization that you might want to do something for because those communities or whatever communities you enter, the communities themselves know what the needs are, I believe. And I think that that is really important. And I know I heard just a little bit about obviously the refugees or the people who are coming who are human beings that are incredibly vulnerable and frightened and coming into a strange, place that they never thought in their lives they would have to come to. So the opening of arms and being welcoming and being loving and finding whatever it is, furniture, um, food, needs, but you can find out whatever your gift is by going to wherever you want to give your gift and um, do, doing something about it. And yes, I think thoughtfulness and care in deciding what you will do is very important. And I have learned in my own family history when we talk about immigrants, <coughs> I'm a direct descendant from Captain John Gallup who came here in 1630. And we talk about being immigrants. I found out in 2005, my family committed genocide to the native peoples and enslave people from Africa. So I get really um, uncomfortable when people talk about you know, the immigrants, those people, the other. What are we talking about? These are human beings who are suffering and the women and children that are just trying to hold on. I mean, it's, it, you can see I'm filling up because it really, it, it is heartbreaking and does need response. And this is a wonderful part of it. Thank you.
want to speak in favor of the uncomfortable conversations and moving into uncomfortable conversations. My name is Sarah Mugridge, and I'm a member of the Berkshire chapter of Surge, Showing Up for Racial Justice. It's a national organization some of you might be familiar with. Um, it's a group that's dedicated to organizing white folks for racial justice. Um, and really kind of at the heart of that is um, combining, in, in all of our efforts, combining <laughs> action and accountability. Um, so our um, local accountability partner is Multicultural Bridge, which I've heard some people mention. I mean, this is an organization that is working um, with immigrant communi communities here in the Berkshires. Um, and really, you know, this is, this is kind of the space that I found um, where, again, it's, it's the thought <laughs> and it's the action. And it's not doing um, the sort of um, or falling for the urgency, right, at the, at the expense of um, meaningful action. So, oh, and our next meeting is on Saturday, for anyone who's interested. <laughs> Barbara Palmer from Turingham, and I'm an immigrant actually from Germany. Uh, I came here as a 13-year-old, so um, the echoes of the last year, um, particularly for a German, are, are horrifying. Um, so I'm, um, as my, I'm glad to hear you call for us to take the time to think about that, because I feel like I've been wanting to crawl into a hole and, and try to understand, but the one um, urgent call I'd like to make to all of us is uh, recognizing the importance of um, a free press um, for uh, a d any democracy. It's one of the three legged stools that a democracy needs and we all need to be supporting the free press. Um, the getting all our information free has an enormous price. One, we're selling our information to uh, companies, but two, um, we are not able to get good information if it's free because then somebody else is paying for it for different needs. So please subscribe to newspapers or pay for um, online access to newspapers. It's so important. The reason that we're finding out what we're finding out um, these last few days is because there are still some really good journalists out there that are being paid to do that work. So um, please, thank you. Very helpful, Barbara, thank you. And feel free to let people know how to be in touch with these other efforts and groups that we're learning about tonight. Other thoughts? Why did you come tonight? What were you hoping to take away or gather from this forum? I would suspect you all care about the issues, trying to determine how to help, what to do. Other reasons? Free food, that's a hallmark here at Rockwell Museum. It always gets people out, especially on a cold winter night. Are you gonna finish it all before they get the rest of it? <laughs> <laughs> we hope you will. <laughs> yes, please. Come on back up. Well, but then our online audience can't hear you. Thank you. I think one of the things that I wanted to do is to find out who's doing what because I've spent a lot of my time working with not-for-profits and one of the frustration is, or community action groups, one of the frustrations is that they're fragmented and they don't um, collaborate and people are doing wonderful things in little pockets and if we could know who is doing what and collaborate uh, and not just hold on to our own little fiefdom that we're doing, um, I think we could have a greater impact and so part of my purpose here is to find out what's going on, who's interested in what, and how we can work together. I think another, another important action 
uh, we can each do is be in touch with our elected officials, both on a, a local and state level and our federal officials. We've elected them. They need to know uh, the feelings and beliefs in our communities and uh, how all of us are feeling about different issues. So in addition to subscribing to paid journalism, I think this is another way we have voices as citizens, and they really do want to hear from us. Uh, they're here to help guide policy and practice and action, and they very much appreciate knowing what is on your minds, all of our minds. I think you were going to speak again. Did you have something? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, I guess I'll go to Tanya. Uh, I, I, I'd like someone to address the kind of stuff that's coming out of D.C., is immigration actually the problem that they're portraying it to be? And, you know, when they repealed the, the executive order, were, were criminals flowing into the country like rivers or whatever? Could someone speak to those uh, allegations? So the ban was on for how long? A day <laughs> before it, the injunction, and nothing changed. Um, if criminals were flowing in the day before, they were <laughs> flowing in that day. Um, personally, I don't think criminals are flowing in. Um, we have actually an incredible system of security um, in regards to refugees especially. Refugees tend to be in camps um, and displaced for years while they wait to get vetted. The average vetting time is 18, to 18 months to two years. Um, that's in addition to whatever time it's taken the UN um, Council to determine that they are in fact going to get refugee status. So, and they go through 20 layers of background checks they are the most scrutinized um, and most vetted group of individuals coming into the country. So, um, you know, when we hear word of people saying, well, you're sending in terrorists, it just isn't true. Data shows historically it it's hasn't been true. And again, especially with this new level of awareness, I think the security is going to just get tighter and tighter. And so, um, I do believe that those who are arriving, um, especially you know the, the, those who are coming to our community, will be incredible neighbors. They will teach us a great deal. We will learn from them, um, and I think it will only strength help to strengthen our community. I have a little bit of information from uh, the Berkshire Eagle that I brought with me tonight. Uh, just an excerpt from their editorial. Um, this past Sunday, well, two weeks ago, uh, January 29th. Um, in our opinion, immigrant ban weakens Pittsfield and the nation. And just a couple of paragraphs out of it, the bans are solutions in search of, a, of problems. The extreme vetting of immigrants and refugees the president calls for has long been in place, as Hillary just mentioned. Refugees go through an approval process of 18 months to two years to come to the United States, and families are a priority over single men. No Syrian refugee has been linked to an incident of domestic terror in the United States. While the United States Refugee Admissions Program, under which 50 Syrian and Iraqi refugees would come to Pittsfield, has been suspended for 120 days by executive order, local officials told the Eagle, they will continue to forge ahead even though the ban on Syrian refugees would seem to override or at least contradict the admissions program. They should do so. The project is a worthy one, is the opinion of the editors. Uh, President Trump's assertion Friday that Christian refugees will be given priority over Muslim refugees would violate the fundamental principle that America does not judge anyone, newcomers or citizens, on the basis of religion. A Pew Research Center study found that Christian and Muslim refugees were admitted on a roughly equal basis in 2016. There's no need to introduce a quota system. 
On Sunday, the president asserted the ban was not anti-Muslim and backed away from backing away from a quota system would prove this. Um, we did have a question from the internet. It's very small. I'm going to try to read it. <laughs> um, much of the groundswell for the support of our current president came from the heartland of America, not so much on the coasts or in the Northeast. How do we address the concern of immigration in places like the heartland? Is there anyone here who would have a thought on that? Please. Virginia. I also moved here. Um, so being from Virginia, I have access to people that people from Massachusetts probably don't have access to politically. Um, so right after the election, I kept thinking to myself, what is my role in trying to talk to people that I have access to? Thinking about what is my role as somebody who is white and somebody who is female and somebody who is from the South, um, what types of people do I have access to in my social network that I could maybe talk to, I could, not in the sense of trying to sway them, but just in the, in the way of starting a dialogue. Um, it's easy for us to be in, in an echo chamber here in this room, and it's easy for them to be in an echo chamber in the heartland or wherever. Um, so. That was just one of the things that kept running through my mind after the election was what are the personal connections that I know of that I can utilize um, to kind of maybe open up a dialogue and start hopefully changing some people's minds. Um, so that's my strategy. Think about the people that you know personally that you could talk to. There's probably at least one person in your life. I think that question from um, online uh, is related to the, uh, the previous question about whether uh, immigration is really a, uh, a big issue in this country or not. Um, and um, I think a lot of that, the, uh, the anxiety in the heartland of America and, and you know, what is uh, euphemistically known as the Rust Belt of America, um, as well as um, this anxiety uh, over uh, immigration. A lot of it has to do with, I think, the, uh, the, the, the changing economic face of America over the last 30 years. Uh, the fact that um, we have become much more deindustrialized, that we have lost a lot of manufacturing jobs. Um, and I think a lot of um, people who live in the heartland who no longer can make the living that they used to um, and don't see a, uh, a path forward for their children to be able to have the, the, the level of comfort that they may have had or that they, uh, or that they may have expected for themselves. Um, when faced with all of that, I think there is a tendency to want to blame somebody. I think there is a tendency to blame a cause uh, for all of that. Um, I think it is um, interesting that the people who live the farthest away from any of our borders tend to be the ones who feel most anxious about uh, immigrants and, uh, and immigration in general. Um, but I think a lot of that also has to do with the fact that we have become uh, much less industrialized, that uh, a number of our trade agreements uh, have quote unquote offshored uh, a number of our jobs as well. Uh, but also that technology has made um, manufacturing much cheaper uh, and that uh, we don't need as many people to make automobiles or to make steel um, as, as we used to. Um, so I think then there is a sense of anxiety. I think there is a sense to want to blame somebody. Uh, in the 80s, it was really you know, the, uh, the, the Japanese um, taking over and uh, uh, destroying our uh, automotive industry because of the cheap, cheap quote unquote imports uh, from Japan. Um, I think uh, later on, um, there was a tendency to want to blame uh, Latinos for, uh, for taking jobs um, and, and making uh, wages drop, which isn't true. Um, and, um, and, and the fact of the matter is that I, I think that anxiety coupled with um, the, uh, 
the, um, the rhetoric that we've had for a long time about America becoming a minority majority country soon. Um, for many, uh, I think that is a, uh, a threatening thing. And so is immigration in of itself an issue? Um, no, I don't think so. But I think the way uh, we talk about it and I think the, um, the way we haven't really um, address the economic issues of the people who are feeling uh, under threat, um, I, I think has exacerbated uh, this issue, um, I think more than it probably you know, should have. Uh, and, and we just need to, I think, and I think we are at a point where we need to start talking about all of these things together. I'm a political scientist, right? So I should be worried a lot about what people think. I am, but I think if we, s if we miss the, the fact that when we start thinking of a democracy, we have one thing in mind, and when we think of a liberal democratic state that has had to preserve itself as a world power for a long time, that not all of these things are somehow emerging from the people, right? Like that there's a certain way that the fantasy of democracy as being something that like, oh, this is the aggregate of what people are feeling. And this is, you know, so there, those things I feel are sort of post hoc explanations. They don't give the complete explanation. Like a lot of what was happening in the 1990s, and like 1920s in Germany was not kind of grassroots up, right? These are a particular class of people kind of has the ability to interpret a form of situation as a kind of injury to themselves, the way a white middle class has interpreted here, not the poorest whites, right? I think I'm really afraid of the poor shaming that comes with the sense of like the Rust Belt or whatever, like we start to name spaces as if somehow everything's a kind of monolith or self-contained kind of entity. I think there's something else going on if we don't think politically that for how many years, even under democratic administration, all of these situations were put in place, the beginnings of nothing new is happening. These are all intensifications of things that, that have been in motion for a long time. So, so I, just don't, I just feel like we can blind ourselves to this issue of the immigration. As a pro immigration is a problem for a failing state that wants to assert itself as a world power in the same way as white people want to assert themselves as the powerful in all parts of the world, right? So there's a certain, and I don't mean, I think whiteness is different from individual white people. I think it's a structure the same way as state structures have to preserve themselves. So the Im immigration is a problem for a state that is built on having control over borders, right? Whose very claim to power in the world is about binding its borders in a certain way, right? So the immigration will always be an effect, like an, uh, you know, kind of a consequence of that need. So we have to really think about the world system as a basically messed up situation that like when we are trying to solve and alongside the fact that that system has been built to preserve capitalism and white supremacy and there's no other way to think about it. Like this, I'm not making an argument. I'm actually stating a fact and it's not an alternative fact, right? So I'm just saying that there's a, to, to, to think that the, the people's voices are being, are somehow making this happen is also to kind of let off the hook that the structures have never served pretty much anyone except for a small class of people, always. And, and that's just something to think about that, yeah, why even dignify immigration as a problem or ask those questions instead of saying, how, why did it have to be produced as a problem and by whom? And it wasn't the guy sitting in front of the TV for 15 hours who produced that, right? It was the people who were talking to him, right? Or not talking to him, right? So I just think that, yeah, there's a certain way that getting overly sanguine about democracy also gets us to sort of not think about whose interest is in, in producing these problems. And I don't think in the little, yeah. <laughs> and also fact-wise, the, these little counties, I mean, studies have happened where all these claims were made about these counties have suffered the most. They have actually not suffered. I mean, if you actually do the statistics, like average sort of middle-class white incomes have gone up. And so the whole narrative of the injury to the white middle class is also <laughs> a production of a narrative that we have to counter, right? Like at every level. And why is that? And so you have a president who is doing what 
somebody like Hitler did for a short time in order to get into power, and this person is doing it while he is in power, right? Which is like, so you can gain power by saying, look, we are the victimized state, look, we have suffered so much, look, America is no longer great, let's make it great again. But what you actually see is something really unusual, that that's the narrative that's continuing right now, is like, look how we suffer, and that seems kind of mind-blowing, right? That it's not coming at, the claim to greatness is not being made, it's still deferred, right? It's that somehow we have lost something, and that wasn't even happening for so much, like that got Hitler into power, but it wasn't the narrative of the continuing right, Third Reich didn't keep saying, look, we are so bad, <laughs> so, yeah, we are so hurt. It was, so I think there's something here to, to kind of destabilize this question of vulnerable populations and try to shape it in a different way, I think, this is not our way out. Is to yeah. Actually, this is the right. I'm Patricia Hubbard, and I live in Sandusfield. Um, and I, so just getting off of the last, just I've been thinking and trying to process a lot of Lori's questions and the comments that have been made and trying to think of Lori's real question is, why are we here? Why am I here? Um, I certainly was one of those people who felt after the election this call to be active and run around and try to march and do things, and then took time to think about it. And one of the reasons that this whole question of immigration um, is poignant to me is that my husband's grandmother and his aunt were both on the St. Louis, which was the ship, um, for people who don't know, but maybe you've seen the movie, there was a movie called The Voyage of the Damned, but it was a ship that left Belgium filled with German refugees or Jewish refugees from many countries. Um, prior to the United States entering the war, came to, most of those people had basically taken whatever money they were able to get out of, largely Germany, um, to pay for their passage on the ship and when they got to the United States, Roosevelt revoked the ship's ability to enter the country, so they sailed down the coast of the United States and got to Cuba. Um, there was actually a picture on the front page of the New York Times of my husband's grandmother standing on the bow of the ship, pointing at her husband who was on land in Cuba, um, and she and her 10-year-old daughter couldn't get off the ship, and the ship then had to go back to Belgium, where most of those people who no longer had any money left or any resources left, many of them had to go back to Germany, many of them went to France, many of them died um, in the war. My husband's grandmother and his aunt were lucky enough to gather money basically through the um, Jewish Committee for Joint Distribution and they were able to get passage on another ship um, two weeks before the Nazis invaded Belgium, so they were able to get to the United States. We went to a memorial service for, with, I went with my children when they were quite young. It was the 65th anniversary of the St. Louis, and it was held at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., and also in the Capitol Rotunda, so the survivors who were there, um, so 65 years later, it was anybody who was basically a child um, on the ship were telling stories during the weekend. They lit candles at the Holocaust Museum, um, marched in the ca our capital rotunda with our armies um, who freed them from the different, the people from the different concentration camps. It was obviously a moving, poignant time but the important part of that is that our country didn't let those people into the United States. Our country at that time, they were the other. Mm -hmm. People didn't care really. Um, our, we kept them out, like now we're keeping other people out. We were sending people back to certain death as we're doing now um, on a variety of economic levels and a variety of backgrounds, and I think that 
I mean, I live in a tiny town of 500 people. It's easy to get caught up sitting on your mountaintop and thinking everything's great. And I guess for me, it's really important to the extent possible to stay connected and feel that I and my family can do whatever we can to be part of this larger community that makes up our world. So that was all I wanted to say. Thank you, Patricia. That was beautifully heart spoken. And we have a question uh, from the internet. With the popularity of social media, people seem to be very apt to categorize people. They are either this or that, which translates into a very polarizing environment. There seems to be little wiggle room for being open to different points of view or even different points of origin. How can we accomplish a proactive and constructive dialogue online regarding immigration? Any thoughts on that question? Any active users of, please, social media here? So um, I think my question is kind of related without it being on social media, but um, I kind of think about how to open dialogue um, at the museum. I kind of lead the Nick Cave exhibit tours and just I'm kind of thinking about the question of how to get everyone's voices out, whether or not they categorize themselves or society categorizes them on their opinions or where they're from. But um, I think that it kind of starts in your own communities or in your own spaces, whether they're museums or public spaces, and then how does that translate to social media? So I think it's just creating that atmosphere, you know, if it's on my tours or if it's um, how I interact with people in my community. Um, and I just think it's like an overall idea of how we can open the discussion so that it's not just me voicing, you know, my little perspective and just opening up for others, whether or not they're going to agree with me. So, yeah. I hope I hope our forum this evening is offering ideas of how to talk about this with um, your friends and those who agree or disagree uh, with you. Um, I know that one question, um, well, an answer to the question I asked, why are we here tonight? Why do we care? Why do we want to act on this issue? And for myself, I know that it means a lot to me that the world thinks that the United States of America is a welcoming place. And this closing of borders and this polarizing language and uh, fear inducing activity, um, it really bothers me as an individual. It's not how I want America to be. So when people feel compelled to act, I think uh, we all have individual and personal reasons. And um, I was reading a lot of news articles and background on preparing for tonight. And these were just a couple of the foreign leader uh, comments to President Trump's action. Foreign leaders slammed the ban. UK Prime Minister Theresa May said, we do not agree with this kind of approach. German Chancellor Angela Merkel called Trump herself and reminded the President of the United States obligations to refugees under the Geneva Conventions. London Mayor Sadiq Khan called the ban shameful and cruel. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau tweeted that refugees were very welcome in Canada. So there's a global dialogue going on about the activities and actions of our country. And I guess if I may put you on the spot, Asma, but maybe to offer clarity on your remarks, I feel like I'm hearing two ranges of thought from you. One that the reaction of this nation and the government the government's policy, the president's policy, is a government action um, designed and created to create a certain reaction by the people and the citizens. And on the other hand, I hear you counseling, pause, be thoughtful, let's not overreact, let's not dive into this crisis. And there's a contradiction in that, I think, that I'm feeling in your remarks, and I don't know um, how others in the room are feeling. 
uh, and, and I don't mean to put you on the spot because I think the thoughtfulness is very important that uh, immediate reactionary um, activity might make us feel good but maybe doesn't in the end accomplish an action. But could you address that and talk a little more about what you mean? One, I, let me correct. I, I don't think thoughtful action means inaction, right? I don't think it's about not acting or letting things take their course at all. It's just really thinking that quite often those of us who feel able to act, act from a place without challenging what enables us to act. And quite often those are privileges that have, might have to be questioned, for instance, right? who hosts the Women's March and who seemed to be a guest, right? Who, you know, so for instance, right? So, mo so much of the, our experience of being at the Women's March as women of color, more radical women, like, you know, our students were told not to s disrupt property, right? I mean, so, th so how are we welcoming two pro more radical progressive ideas without in some ways shutting them down in the name of expediency, right? So, so I guess I'm just thinking of not even um, effective, but a kind of efficiency sometimes can be thoughtless, right? So I guess I'm just thinking of there might be important reasons to to be inefficient, right? <laughs> In the sense of like how a kind of non seemingly non-productive act of building community with another person around thoughtfulness or thinking, and this comes was bringing to me what I had said about civility years ago. I said like you can't think of civil discourse as some sort of isolated, um, um, put on an isolated pedestal without thinking of how many really brutal wars are being fought abroad and in, <laughs> in our own communities. And so civility can't just be somehow like kind of taken out of the context of a general brutality, cruelty or lack of relation that seems to stand in place of a really, a, a community that's able to hold people actually hold people without conditions. So, so when I say that it's the state, and I guess I'm trying to think about, again, I have a history of studying these things in the sense that, you know, as long as the United States has existed, for, for as long as it has existed, it's still, pres and longer than most nation states that we know, right, in the current form, it hasn't, like Max Weber, again, I'm going to the Germans, sorry, this is that kind of day, right? Like he says in 1919, yeah, Germ America is a really immature country. Like it always loves to be young and immature, right? Like there's a sense of it always like fumbling and then trying, and so of course we see in the next 30 years the, the gesture to a kind of world power, the production of a new world order around after the Holocaust, right? And after Second World War. What I'm trying to say is that in if we get kind of caught within public opinion issues, right, or why 32 people percent people still like Donald Trump, and our, the language of pride was used in a, in a survey recently. How many of you are proud of, of the president? Like there's like, you know, 39 or 33 or 39 percent people have pride, which is something worth thinking about, but I, at the same time, I am not, sleepless thinking about it. And I'm just being honest, like it's sort of one, it doesn't shock me. I guess I'm just trying to say the question of crisis and shock have to be disaggregated. That if we know the history of this country and what happens in our communities with African Americans, with genocide, all of our complicities in these things, then the manifestation in these like small ways of like, I will, I'll make this hard for you, right? I'll break the system, like that sort of that, gesture, I almost have some empathy for that gesture and it's not keeping me up at night, as much as the fact that if we, those who seem to be on the right side of things right now, maybe not on the right side of history, but feel morally in a better place than the other, if we somehow end up focusing either on the personality of the president or the personality of Mike Flynn, for instance, or on just like, thinking about like what kind of woman must it be who voted for Donald Trump and you know, I mean, you can think about those things but I don't think they're ultimately what's going to produce change because what it will do is like send us back into the rabbit hole of saying somehow you produced this single-handedly without a structure that has rewarded its reproduction. So I guess I'm trying to say that stepping back is not stepping back to in not act, it's stepping back in order to see better, 
And that stepping back might make us look at each other in a way we haven't looked because we have always been looking at the public opinion poll that somehow is the only way we hear people addressing political questions. So I think this is a time to build those political communities that will save us more than the state will save us or has ever saved us. And that's just political <laughs> truth, right? It's the truth of institutions. Why not we build institutions that can hold each other rather than look to the state as the one arbiter, right? That also will never actually help those <laughs> historically on whose backs it's built. So I just want us to think of that like when we, um, which is not to say we don't want the country to be better, better government, better institutions, but to focus on that and the relationship of the common man, so to speak, to that mode of power really is a limited way of looking at things and we have a chance to actually look at ourselves and at each other more than just that one power because I just think it's, it's gonna take it's gonna sap us and we will still be in the same place, right? People are saying, if the impeachment happens in three months, so many of these voices will go away and the same stuff will keep happening, right? So, so I guess I'm just saying this is a time to open up. I'm not forgiving the evil. <laughs> I'm not saying look away from that, but there's a lot of good to look at in the sense that maybe something more lasting change can happen if we are trying to build institutions that might protect us, hold us, and also challenge those things in the state or the government, and by state I mean the state as an institution, not the state of Massachusetts, right? That that institution can be pushed by our institutions better than somehow just always looking at, you know, that one place from which all executive orders happen. So that's, I, I was, um, does that resolve? <laughs> On to the uh, near to the end of our uh, time to speak, and I'd love to have you come up and join us. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Brianna. Uh, I guess I have a couple questions, maybe relating to what Asma was saying, and a little bit to the gentleman over there, um, in terms of the things that we already know or things that haven't really changed. Um, what? does security really mean to you? Uh, I guess I'm saying that as I, a couple days ago I went to the JFS Pittsfield um, immigration talk and, and there was a lot about, oh, the two year, the 10 year, the 20 year like inspection <laughs> period where someone determines if you are safe enough to enter this country at the same time asking you to prove that you are afraid to be in your own country. Um, and I guess I think about that standing in the Norman Rockwell Museum and wondering what has it meant to be safe for me and what has it meant to be safe for my family and what does it mean to be safe for all of us and who is security for and what do we really want when we say we want security. Matthew. Uh, I'm indebted to Asma for this article, and uh, so are many others. Um, it's an article on uh, the banned 400-year-old Shakespearean speech being used for refugee rights today. So just to read some from it. Um, some 600 years ago in, a mediev in medieval England, feverish xenophobia swept through the population as 64,000 foreigners from wealthy Lombard bankers to Flemish laborers arrived on English shores between 1330 and 1550 in search of better lives. Locals blamed them for taking their jobs and distorting their culture. Tensions reached to zenith on May 1st, 1517, as riots broke out in London and a mob armed with stones, bricks, bats, boots, and boiling water attacked the immigrants and looted their homes. Thomas More, familiar name to some, uh, then the city deputy sheriff, 
tried to reason with the crowd. This dark day in history known as Evil May Day was portrayed in a then banned play called The Book of Sir Thomas More, believed to be written between 1596 and 1601. William Shakespeare and two other writers were called to edit the manuscript with the bard contributing the 147 lines of Moore's emphatic pro-immigrant monologue. And this is that monologue from the book of Sir Thomas More, Act Two, Scene Four. Grant them removed, and grant that this, your noise, hath chid down all the majesty of England. Imagine that you see the wretched strangers, their babies at their backs and their poor luggage, plodding to the ports and coasts for transportation, and that you sit as kings in your desire. Authority quite silent by your brawl, and you in rough of your opinions clothed. What had you got? I'll tell you. You had taught how insolence and strong hand should prevail. How order should be quelled. And by this pattern, not one of you should live an aged man. For other ruffians, as their fancies wrought with some same hand, self-reasons and self-right, would shark on you. And men, like ravenous fishes, would feed on one another. Say now, the king should so much come too short of your great trespass, as but to banish you, whither would you go? What country, by nature of your error, should give you harbor? Go you to France or Flanders, to any German province, to Spain or Portugal, nay, anywhere not that adheres to England, why, you must need be strangers. Would you then be pleased to find a nation of such barbarous temper that breaking out in hideous violence would not afford you an abode on earth? wet their detested knives against your throats, spurn you like dogs, and like as if that God owed no, not nor made you, nor that the claimants were not all appropriate to your comforts, but chartered unto them, what would you think to be thus used? This is the stranger's case, and this your mountainish inhumanity. I think we will let the bard have the last word. Thank you all for coming. Join us in the lobby for refreshment.